Mustard Tavern Keepers, History of the Old World. Gave me quite a scare there. I thought maybe the Skaven had snuck in, thrown you in a bag, and dragged you off to who knows where again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Lightning never strikes the same place twice. Well, I'm not sure about that, actually. Azo, wieso? I feel much better now. Purged und light. <laughs> well, excellent, excellent. Well, the neophytes are waiting. And I've got us all a keg of your favorite ale. Oh, the triple X. Master Tavern Keeper, you spoil us. I will. You've earned it. Or at least you will have done by the time the night is through. Come along. Uh, they're back. Ah, yes, we're back. I hope you've left some ales for us two old hands. Apprentice Morelli, would you be so kind as to pour our guest speaker a drink, if you don't mind? Eh, uh, si, si. Cheers. <sighs> Thank you, but I must not get too carried away. I have to go down into the sewers tomorrow night to kill some ratmen, and then try and break into the Palazzo del Vonto. We had better crack on with our tail, I think, so I can at least get to bed by dawn. Oh, so you're going to try and take the usurper, Marco Broglio's head, on the morrow. Our thoughts and prayers will be with you. But, yes, for now, by all means, Continue with your tale. You'd got us to the point where the three ships under Marco Colombo's command were heading towards the Arabian-controlled pirate stronghold of Sartosa. And I uh, gave the neophytes here a rundown of Sartosa's history whilst you were uh, powdering your nose. So can you tell us why was he heading there? Yeah, indeed. At first glance, such a move appears like suicide, but this was not the case. If you recall, Marco had spent a number of years in the city of La Chic, in the region known as the Land of Assassins in Arabi. And here he had saved the life of an emir in the Sultan's army. The incident had occurred during one of Marco's frequent visits to the great bazaars there in search of treasures from Lustria to purchase. As the Tylean walked the passages of stalls, he saw the crowds suddenly part to allow a stately man in fine silks to peruse the nearby wares. He was accompanied by two brightly bedecked Janissary guards armed with long curved pole arms. Suddenly, from inside one of the stalls, a woman, dressed in dark, faded robes and brandishing a pair of curved knives, flew out of the shadows. The Janissary guards were quick to act, but their weapons were not ideal for fighting in such close confines, such as a bazaar. Their handles got caught on the baskets, full of rich fabrics, and their blades became entangled in the goods that were dangling from every available nook and cranny above each stall. This gave the assassin, or hashishin, in Arabic, more than ample opportunity 
to thrust her poison blades into the exposed necks of the bodyguards, kick them out of the way, and then disarm the surprised emir. The Hashishin was but a hair's breadth away from ending the life of her mark when suddenly a loud bang echoed through the corridors of the bazaar. The emir's face was splattered with hot blood, but it was not his own. It belonged to the now headless assassin, one of the dread daughters of Tariq, slumped at his feet. The emir looked about him and saw Marco holding his old double-barreled flintlock pistol. Smoke slowly swirling out of its barrel. Now, in Arabic, black powder weaponry is very rare indeed. Their theocratic leadership ostensibly forbids its use by believers, although all the while they are secretly stockpiling and researching the technology. The Amir that Marco had saved was called Abu Dal Vazak, and the two became fast friends. It was this emir who cultivated Marco's love of hunting on horseback, and it was also the emir that convinced him to get rid of his pistol and take up shooting with the crossbow, gifting the Tylean an elegant, handmade weapon constructed by the finest weaponsmiths in Lashik. Now, perchance you recognize the name Abu Darzvazak. You should. It was he that was given rulership of the island of Sartosa by the Sultan after the death of the previous emir in a bizarre accident in his harem involving a snake, a camel, six concubines and a lot of horse oil during the especially hot summer of 1489. He had died childless and Abut al Wazak was his closest living relative. So the Sultan sent his emir to Saltoza to squeeze as many riches from the Tylean Peninsula as possible. And thus he did. However, it was also this ramping up of the activities of the Arabian pirates that would eventually precipitate the retaliatory invasion of Sartosa by the mercenary army of Lucini a decade or so later. Ah, indeed. Throwing a stone into the sea causes no but a few ripples. However, with enough ripples, You've got yourself one hell of a storm. Yeah, yeah, quite. And now back to Marco. So, you see, it was to see his friend, Abd al Vazak, ruler of the Arabian Corsairs of Sartosa, that Marco went in the early spring of 1492. As the three ships under the Tylean's command approached the waters around Sartosa, each unfurled a large red and green maritime flag, the colours of the city of Lashik, upon which was embroidered the curved knife of the land of assassins and the name of Abu Dalzvazik in Arabic script, meticulously rendered by the best needle maidens of Alemas. The trio of vessels were first encountered by some smaller Dao vessels, colloquially known as Jalabas, that immediately recognized the flags. Perplexed, they came closer and, using mirrors to reflect the sunlight, they signaled the lead Tylean ship. Fortunately, Marco had anticipated this and had his heliograph at the ready. He slowly and carefully signaled the message he had been practicing for the previous months, a greeting and his desire to see the Emir. Lions of the roaring seas, we are honored to plow the same waters. 
I am Marco Colombo, friend and protector to Abd al-Vazak. Grant me the favor of allowing me to visit my friend. I bear him a gift of great value and importance. Tarry us not, rather guide us to the great emir of Sartosa. It took Marco about a quarter of an hour to relay the lengthy message. There was no reply from the lead Dao, though. And Marco would later tell my grandpapa that he was very worried about his plan, that it would fail, and his ships would be confiscated and each of the crew sold into slavery. More Corsair ships began to swarm to the area, and the situation for the three Tylian ships began to look most ominous. Suddenly, towering above even the war dows, a large vessel cut through the sea like a scimitar through flesh. Marco recognized it immediately. It was a pleasure barge. He had seen them in the harbor of La Chique during his time there, but had never seen one on the open seas. Its prow was a golden hashishin, wielding a curved blade, and a huge air elemental spirit, known as a jinn, hovered behind it, blowing wind into its two large triangular sails, sending the vessel hurtling forwards. It quickly covered the water between it and Marco's own ship, La Mermidia, and as it drew close, the jinn evaporated into the air as if it had never been. An Arabian man in fine silks raced to the prow of the ship, pulled out an extraordinarily long telescope and trained it on the Tylean vessel. Suddenly, the man grew excited and started waving his arms in the air. A small boat was then launched from the pleasure barge, a ship he would later learn was called the Golden Jambia, to transport Colombo, and only Colombo, to the great Arabian ship. He was greeted by his old friend, Emir Abu al Vazak, himself upon his arrival, and there was much merriment, with the traditional extravagant Arabian courtesy in full display. Here, Marco spent a day and a night before returning to his ship laden with grapes and olives from the island of Sartosa. The three ships of Colombo's were to be escorted to the open waters of the great ocean by a flotilla of war dows, but from there they would have to make their own way to Lustria. As soon as the Tylean ships were once more alone on the open seas, Marco made his way to the ship La Mercopia, under the command of my grandpapa, and explained exactly what had just transpired. Marco went on to tell of the fate of Abu al Vazak's father, a great warrior who was killed at the Battle of al Haik by a Bretonian baron named Odo de Otremera in a duel at the end of their great crusade. He wore an heirloom of the family, a magical ring of healing. The ring had the power to rapidly rejuvenate its wearer, curing even fatal wounds. But in the battle, the finger upon which the ring had been worn had been severed, and its loss had resulted in his father's death, and the loss of the ring to the victor of the duel, the Baron. Abu al Vazak had related this particular story, and the loss of the irreplaceable ring to Marco 
during his time in Nashik, and the Thailian had sworn an oath to recover the item. In return, Abu al Fazak swore to give Marco something that would allow him to win the rulership of the Thailian city-state of Trantio. In the years since, Marco had conducted a great deal of research whilst trading in Bretonia. He learned that after the end of the crusade, Odo de Otremera had given the ring to his wife, although she had never worn it, as it had been too large for her dainty fingers. Upon her death in 1489, she had been buried in the crypt of his castle, and the night went into a prolonged period of mourning. He gave away almost all of her belongings, finding the sight of them too painful to endure. But the knight had an Arabian retainer, a fearsome warrior known as Suleiman le Saracen, who had recognized the ring as an heirloom of Araby. He took the ring to the port of Brion in the hope of securing passage back to Araby in order to return the ring to its original owner, whose name had been inscribed on the inside of the ring. However, that year, plague beset the port, and no ships either came to nor left the city. The aged Suleiman waited there for months through the long winter for the self-imposed quarantine to end. News of this came to Marco's ears, and he made with great haste to Brion, sailing around the Estalian Peninsula in the small Thailian merchant ship upon which he was serving as the navigator, to finally reach the Bretonian port. The captain of the vessel refused to dock at the port, even though the plague had run its course by then having devastated the pork quarter of the city as it always did, but going no further. Marco had to go ashore alone by use of one of the ship's rowing boats. This he did, and inquiring around the city. Marco spoke Bretonian very well, by the way. He quickly found the Arabian knight, Hale and Helsi, thanks to the ring. Marco told the tale of Abd al Wazak in his best Arabian and showed him the crossbow that the Emir had gifted him, a message of gratitude inscribed upon its stock. Marco promised that he would see the ring returned and Suleiman gladly handed it over. He was eager to leave the port and return to his friend Odo as he worried about the great sadness that had gripped him. As it happened, Marco had recently procured a magical item known as a lyre of melody, a most splendid instrument that played beautiful and haunting melodies, which he gave to the Arabian to give to his knight, in the hopes it might ease the loss in his heart. And with this, the two parted. Marco was eager to return the ring to Abad al Wazak in Lashik, but before he could do so, he learned that his friend had moved to Sartosa as its new emir. And so, back on the Arabian pleasure barge, three years later, Marco was finally able to return the ring to its rightful owner. Emir Abul Dazwazak was beyond happy, and as promised, he handed the Thailian an ancient scroll upon which was written the secret which Marco would use to take the city of Trantio after his return from Lustria. The Emir also gave Marco a day and a night upon his pleasure barge to do with as he pleased. After this, as a last parting gift, 
he gave Marco his personal navigator's telescope. One of the finest ever made by the artisans of La Chique, and as many grapes and olives as he could fit onto his rowing boat for his men. And he additionally guaranteed Marco's ship's safe passage to the great ocean. And now the voyage of Marco Colombo can truly begin. Excellent. And I think it's time perhaps we took a little break. It sounds like your voice is getting a little bit hoarse. Ah, and look here. Dear Heinrich, I might draw you and everyone else's attention to this keg of triple X. It is empty. Ah, yeah, yeah, that must be attended to before we can proceed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in that case, Apprentice Morelli, if you'd be so kind as to fetch another, it would be very much appreciated. See. And neophytes, whilst we wait, I think this is an excellent opportunity to stretch our legs. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go and get my pipe. I will be back in a jiffy.